So this morning I want to talk to you about, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Uh, before we get into this context, uh, I want us to see that the king has a cause. Uh, Jesus Christ himself communicated that he has had a cause, has a cause, um, and the reason he came. There was a reason. Jesus didn't show up just to show up. In fact, Jesus would not show up if the Father had not sent him. But when the Father sent him, then he came with God's purpose. Another way to say it is he came with a cause. All right? And so we see in John chapter 18, we'll start in verse 37. It says this, Jesus, and this is out of the New King James Version. It says, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Asked him a question. And Jesus says, you say rightly that I'm a king. So Jesus is acknowledging, yes, I'm a king. Now, he didn't look like the kings of the earth now. He didn't show up with a crown on. He didn't come in with pomp and circumstance. He looked like just a regular individual. But he's like, yes, I am a king, right? You've said it. He said, for this cause, I was born. Why was he born? Because I'm a king. For this cause, I was born. And for this cause, I have come into the world. You understand, Jesus sits on the throne in heaven. He did not have to come to earth to be made king. Okay. He said, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. This is why I, I uh, always tell a believer, take a step back before you say, I can't hear God. Because if you are a lover of truth, then you're going to hear him. If you're not hearing him, then you may be admitting you don't want to hear truth. Because any one of him hears his voice, those of the truth will hear his voice. And when you hunger for truth, and truth is not uh, words alone, okay, though they are is contained within words, truth actually is a spirit. Jesus said that I'm going to send the spirit of truth. So truth is more than just what actually took place on January 6th. Truth is more than what took place in a current event in our world. Will we ever get to the truth of it? Well, eventually we will get to the truth of it all. Because there is a righteous judge in heaven that will reveal all things in time. And he will judge things that we don't even know were worth judging. They were centuries ago. Things that have happened millenniums ago that it will show up in the courtroom of God and God will righteously judge each case. Is there not a cause? Jesus says there's a cause. So think about it now. If Jesus came, he said, I was born for this cause to be king. Now, most people's interpretation of Jesus is only one aspect of Jesus. And that is the aspect that resulted of Adam eating fruit. Because we know that the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. One translation says rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, over all the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man, male and female, made them both to have dominion or rulership. And he takes this man, puts him in the garden. He says, now, Adam, you can eat from any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for the day you eat. You will surely what? Die. Now, he didn't cease to breathe that day, but he was eternally separated from God. And most know that as the fall, right? If you've gone to church anywhere or been around some believers, you've typically heard this context of the fall. Now, because Adam did eat the fruit, Jesus had to operate in a role that most identify him as, and that is Savior of the world. He saved us, right? Because Adam fell, then we've all fallen, and the Bible's very clear, all have fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, and we've all died, and we were in need of a Savior, right? We needed Jesus to forgive us of our sins, right? We needed to have him change us to be born again. These are the things we know about Jesus. But we pose this question here 
that if Adam had never eaten the fruit, where would he be today? He would be still on the same planet right now. He would still actually be alive. And the need for Jesus to save the world would not be necessary. So Jesus doesn't come back just to acknowledge that this is not the acknowledgement he's having with Pilate, the governor of Rome in the region of Jerusalem. He's not saying, I'm, I'm the savior. He says, I am a king. Because there's something man lost in the garden that I've come back to restore. Yeah. Now, most based upon savior thinking is a relationship with God. And that is true. Because once you're born again, you're made new and you actually are back in a relationship with God. But who is God? Who is your father? Your father is the creator of of all things, and he sits on a throne. By all rights, he's a ruler. He's king. Jesus Christ is a king, that he's the king of kings. Now, we don't think in these terms much because, you know, we like the religious side of Jesus more than the kingdom side of Jesus. Yet, Isaiah is very clear, very clear in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He said, a child will be born, a son will be given, Notice the son's not born because the son always existed. But the son took on flesh, came back into the earth. A child is born, a son is given, and the government, the Bible says, will rest on his shoulder. Jesus came back to reinstitute a government in the earth, more so than just to save humanity from their sins. Now, in order for his government to be able to have uh, citizens, they must be forgiven. They must be saved out from underneath the rule that they are in. In fact, Colossians chapter 1 tells us, I believe it's around verse 9, uh, that begins to talk about, or it could be 13, that he's transferred us from the domain or the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, if the kingdom of his beloved son is heaven alone, then the minute we got born again, we should have left the planet. We should have left the planet. But we did not leave the planet, which means then the kingdom must be able to be operated in the earth. In fact, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6 when we began to pray, right? Verse 9. Our father. Whose father? Your dad happens to be king. And we need to recognize his position. All right? Our father who art in heaven, that's where he lives. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom. Your will be on as it is. So notice that Jesus' identification here that I have a cause and my cause and the reason I'm born is because I'm a king. Well, there's a reason why the king came to the planet then. Because the king did not come to the planet just to take us out. Are you hearing me? That was not his number one intent. That is not his number one purpose. As a king, he will protect his citizens. And he always protects his righteous ones. Are you hearing me? Will we one day leave the earth? Sure. No doubt. In fact, there is the catching away of the church. Some of us won't even die in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I just believe God is in my generation that I could hold out if I would believe God for this 120. I mean, that's 68 more years from where I'm at today. And man, a lot has happened in my short 52 years. A lot has happened in an accelerated rate. And I'm thinking if it continues this acceleration, man, for sure, for sure, Jesus very well could come back in my lifetime. So why don't I just hold out? Why would I want to go to the grave when I could be transformed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye and then Superman up out of here? That'd be pretty amazing, right? But that's not why Jesus came because not, not all the generations prior Superman out of here. We don't have an advantage if we are the generation that's caught up. All we do is have an event that was prophesied would come, just like an event was prophesied that Jesus would come, and there was a generation that beheld the Messiah, the Son of God, saw him face to face, touched him. Wow. I mean, it had been spoken generations, thousands of years that he was coming. It was spoken the day Adam fell from dominion and ate the fruit. God the Father came down and said, I'm bringing my seed. He's going to show up. 
I'm bringing another king in the earth so that he can restore the kingdom back to humanity. And so what we need to recognize is that Jesus had a king cause. He had a cause as a king. And a king doesn't show up just to take people out. A king shows up to establish authority. A king shows up so that he can reestablish authority that he has. And that's why Jesus walked around under the authority of God, and he did great exploits. In fact, all the miracles, if you study them yourself, you will find in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, fall under the same dominion that Adam had in the garden. This is why he could speak to fish. Adam had dominion over the fish of the sea. This is why he could speak to winds and waves, because this is the earth. This is why he could heal the sick, because man was made out of the dust of the earth. And he had dominion over all the earth, even the suit you're carrying around. Are you hearing me? And so Jesus came back, and he did something very profound. He said, I'm not here to take you out. I'm here to bring heaven down. Yes. Amen. Amen. I've got a cause that I want to reestablish heaven's dominion in the earth through humanity. Because when God created the first Adam, it was so that the heaven realm and the earth realm would look alike. And that the will of heaven would manifest on the will in the will of the earth. And Adam and Eve, for a time frame, experienced that type of life. A, a planet with no sin. Wow. How amazing is that? But we're in a planet that has sin. But Jesus says just because sin's in it doesn't mean the kingdom can't show back up. Doesn't mean the realm of heaven can't influence it. So why does the king have an anointing anyway? Why does he come with this authority of power? Well, it's the other cause. Because he has the cause of king, it enacts the second cause. And this is the one that most refer to because they love Jesus as Savior more than they do King. See, as long as he's Savior to you, then you basically will go through life, living life like you want to. And just thankful when you die, you go to heaven. And so basically, you've picked up the same religious thought that all other religions have, and that is, where are you going to go when you die? But Jesus didn't come to answer that question for you. Jesus came to say, I want to put heaven in you now. I want you to be able to dominate now. And that this eternal life that you'll be with me where sin won't exist at all at some point is a byproduct of this relationship. Because you can experience sinless life now. You have a greater one on the inside of you. But typically, if we're looking at Jesus as an exit strategy, then we won't have a earth strategy. Right? Right? But Jesus is like, nah, let's impact the earth while you're here. <laughs> show them heaven. I said, while you're here, let's show them heaven. But Jesus has another cause. Because he's king and because he's anointed, it allows the other cause of Christ to take place. We find this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And it says, and he, I'm going to read out the Murdoch translation. And he that committed sin is of Satan, because Satan was a sinner from the beginning. Now, that's not from the beginning of time. Because there was a time he didn't sin. There became a time that pride in him caused him to fall. So when you say the beginning, we're talking about the beginning of this book where we have this earth experience that we're learning about, this time frame where, you know, the enemy's already been overthrown in the realm of heaven. And God's created a new heaven, created this earth um, in the beginning we see this um, earth without form of void, and he creates out of chaos this next season that we're in, and he ends up entering into this realm where God calls man to have dominion in the earth. Okay, so Satan was the sinner from the beginning, and for this what? Cause. The Son of God appeared that he might what? Now notice, he came to destroy the works of Satan. And remember what Jesus said, the works that I do, the works that I do, even greater works. So if Jesus is the king and you're a king of the king, I mean, by all rights, how are you going to separate this? 
If Jesus Christ is the king, and he admits he is, and scripture says he is, and then you are born of God in Christ. You are a new creature where? In Christ. Christ is not his last word. That's the Greek equivalent to Messiah, which is the anointed one in his anointing, which is the king eternal. So if you're in the king eternal, then by all rights, you are a child of God. You have, again, in the spirit, the DNA of God. And God, by all right, is a ruler, so you are a ruler. And you rule because you submit to his rulership. So if he's a king that destroys the work of the devil on the earth, then your time frame on the earth as a child of God in Christ, as a little king under the king in the planet, you should be destroying the works of the devil as well. Not holding on until we leave. Barely getting by. Are you hearing me? We should be conquering like Jesus conquered. We should be going into territory and pushing darkness back. We should go in the authority of the kingship we have been given by the name of Jesus. We can speak in that name and in that name. He said, now go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these signs shall follow those who believe, not pastors who believe, not the prophet who believes, not the evangelist who believes, not the teacher, fivefold teacher who believes, not the apostle who believes, but that's believers, that's the saints. These will follow those who believe. They will cast out devils. Are you hearing me? I mean, you're going to walk in an authority that the planet knows that you're not of this world. I mean, you're not even functioning like anybody else. How is this? Instead of this, well, you know what, I, this is, I don't know a lot, but this is what I do know. Because I've asked Jesus to come to my heart and say to me, I know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But yet, heaven never shows up on earth through your life. Now, I'm not saying that that won't be right for a person, that some genuinely have asked Jesus to be the, uh, save them, okay? When I say save them, because literally, he's supposed to be Lord of our lives, and Lord's not even a religious word. It means supreme in authority. So if Jesus is actually Lord of your life, then you're like, I'm submitted to whatever you say. You actually have the supreme authority to dictate what I am to do, and I'll do it willingly and in obedience. Why? Because your love and your life. And my opinion on this doesn't matter. In fact, my mind's got me in so much trouble. It, it, it made me a sinner for so long. I mean, I, I kept running to the flesh. I kept trying to please myself. I kept trying to do it my own way, the way that I thought was right. But it just ended in death and destruction. Everything fell apart. I was never happy or satisfied. And so why do I think now that I'm born again, I know more than God? Right? You know, I'm born again. I don't even need to go to church and learn about God anymore. Why? Because I know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Because you can't tell me that I didn't ask Jesus to come into my heart and save me. Well, he wants to save you, but he wants you to be saved by his lordship. Amen. And that means, yes, Lord. And yes, Lord will fight your flesh, will mess your mind up. He'll make you think in a way that is so crazy that everyone around you be like, you're an idiot. And you'll say, well, I'm not of this world, that's for sure. I don't process information the same way because I'm tapped into a higher power. In fact, that power is eternal and is the only power that will exist for all eternity. Amen. Amen. And his word never fails to come to pass. So Jesus said, I have another cause. Now, what is a cause? A cause is a reason for action, right? A reason for action, something that brings about an effect or a result. And I have found that in the world, there's a lot of causes out there. Is there not a lot of causes? I mean, people are wrapped up in all kind of causes right now. I mean, people are, are, are walking around protesting. There are so many causes. And the reason I, the Lord had me minister this in East Coast camp is because he says, I'm going to lose a generation. Not because they couldn't do it. It's because no one's giving them their cause. The devil has given them a cause, and he's painted it to look like this. Right, wrong. Good versus evil. 
But as our first little testimony said, it's about life and death. So these aren't like right and wrong issues. These are not like good and evil issues. Although there is a right and a wrong, there is a good and an evil. This is life and death stuff. This is stuff that will keep you eternally separated from God stuff. This is stuff that the devil can rain on your parade because you're in his territory stuff. This is where he'll chew you up, spit you out, not only you, but your kids and your kids' kids and the next kids' kids. And by the time we get to the fourth generation of you, y'all so messed up that, that he'll be able to get the wrath of God in your life to where he'll want to eliminate your name from the earth. I mean, it's a horrible thing. And yet, here we do, we mask these things, and people are holding up band, uh, uh, um, you know, ca uh, cardboard and poster boards, and they're chanting all these things, and if you look at them, they are 30 or younger, which tells us the universities have done a really good job of indoctrinating our young people with causes. In fact, even our own public school systems are indoctrinating our children with causes. Yet every one of those causes I could bring to the word and show you a real cause. Because all their causes, number one, they're only dealing with symptoms. What they do is they see something that doesn't look right. And there could be something that doesn't. But it's being masked. And what they do is they're just cutting off a little bit of a limb when the whole tree is dead. And they're putting forth effort, money, time. I mean, they'll wake up. They'll show up at night and burn down buildings. They will uh, graffiti walls, and they will do it in the name of good. In the name of protecting someone's rights. Yet all the while, they're still in gross darkness because they're not dealing with the symptom. They're not dealing with the root. They're not dealing with the real problem. It's not there. Until you get to the root, you can't deal with the symptom. Yet people are putting all kind of effort in trying to save symptoms. And yet the church sits here with the answer. His church does. You know, there are a lot of buildings called churches that aren't his church. But his church actually has the answer. And it will only come if we rise up. Because here's the thing that 2 Chronicles 16, 9 tells us concerning God and his cause. It says, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro through, throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. He says, you acted foolishly. That's just another byproduct of, of some things he's talking about. But that first statement is what I want to talk about. In fact, the New King James says it this way. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Yes. Loyal. Which tells us, and we already know this, because everybody says it anyway. But, you know, saying it and actually living it is two entirely different things. It is always about the heart. It really is. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And here's the thing. God does know your heart. It's true. It's a true statement. Many people say that phrase, well, the Lord knows my heart. And typically when they say it, they're already out. Because they're trying to justify behavior. Well... I'm telling you, in my 20-something, 20 27 years of ministry, the percentage that someone was actually right with that statement is 1% or less. It's 1% of less. It is the religious kickback to don't judge me. And then they move into the don't judge me statement. God knows my heart. Don't judge me. First of all, the Bible is very clear that as a believer, I can judge your fruit. Now, I'm not judging you saying you're going to hell. I'm not pronouncing a sentence on you. I'm not doing that. That's not my position. But I do have a position in the body of Christ to judge your fruit. And if your fruit is not the fruit of the Spirit, then I have every right to come and have a conversation with you. Because how in the world could I ever go to a brother in sin 
to, in order to help restore him unless I talk about the failure that's obviously manifesting in his life. Now, don't judge me. God knows my heart. God knows your heart sucks right now. He knows your heart ain't right with him right now. He knows that you got selfish ambitions right now. I mean, if we want to just be blunt honest, let's just be blunt honest. Let's speak truth, Pastor. Let's speak truth. I mean, let's just go ahead and examine your own heart right now since we're talking about it. How many of you actually came today because you passionately love God? Or how many of you came because your wife told you? Or you know you're supposed to be obligated, but the reality is you're kind of tired of hearing my voice and you wish you could find another place to go. I get it. And it doesn't bother me because you're not going to stop me from doing my purpose. There are many that aren't right with their spouses right now in this room. There are many that aren't right with their children right now in this room. There are many that have ought with their brother right now in this room. And God knows it. And your mask does not hide you. You know, we were under season of mask mandates for a little while, right? You know, you know the cool thing about mask is that you could have some facial expressions without no one knowing. You know, underneath your mask, you're like... You know, you get your smiley eyes. <laughs> right? Drink your teeth. I mean, there's all kinds. And then talking. You know, you're talking. And, and the cool thing about mass is it a little muffles you a little bit. I'll bust you in your face right now. <laughs> what was that? What? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> but God knows your heart. You don't have to say a thing. And the Lord already knows what you're thinking, knows what your attitude is about it, how you are. Where you're. I mean, really, how hard is it to come worship the one who died on a cross, who was beat so bad they couldn't tell he was a man? How hard is it to lift your hands in holy worship? Yeah. Why is the music so loud? Why don't you open your mouth? That's what I want to know. Why can't you sing? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> For some of you, we have to be loud just so you open your mouth because you sing so bad. <laughs> but that's okay. Make a joy noise unto the Lord. We're helping you out, <laughs> if truth be known. <laughs> but I would listen to your rotten voice anyway if your heart was pure in your singing. Yeah. Right? A pure heart uh, will make a horrible voice sound beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Is there not a cause? And God is looking for people whose hearts are completely and loyal to him to bring about his cause, his plan. And his cause is, is that I want to establish kings in the earth that will destroy the works of the devil. What I need is kings to manifest so that they can destroy the works of the devil while they're in the earth. That they won't sit back and wait around for me to bring them home or to die and get there. What they'll do is they'll understand the signs of the time, they'll recognize the principalities that are in the regions that they live in, and they'll get up and take some authority. And that's first and foremost through the reading of the word and prayer, and then another call to action, whatever that may look like. Whatever that may look like. But the first one is I'm passionate about reading his word and I'm passionate about praying about situations. And even if I'm praying about those things and it seems like they're not moving, I know they have to be moving because the king's cause will prevail. It will prevail. Amen? But, you know, a lot of us have our own personal causes. And we're picking up the cause of the world. And I could just name off tons of them. Tons of them. And none... I, not any of these causes, if you just looked at it at face value, is a bad thing. But if you don't get to the root, it won't work. And, and just so you, know, you understand, not all causes are the cause they portray. And that's the problem. Not all causes are the cause they portray. Some causes have hidden agendas. Hidden agendas. Some causes that we have in the realm of global warming right now, just so you know, are about transferring wealth to another group of people. 
The reason why they want to have laws passed is because they want to have the market of the new resource in that world. Okay, you don't want to hear that. That's fine. I mean, we live in a fallen world. Do you really trust governments of the earth? So don't think that things aren't being manipulated for the purpose. Now, at the end of the day, these governments can't control us and they won't overpower us if we know who we are and we stand like the example I'm going to show you. It can work, but you're going to have to do some real standing out in order for you to kill some giants in our day. Amen? So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 to 12 says it this way. It's out of the Message Bible. I really love the way the Message Bible reads. I've written a couple books using this passage of Scripture because anytime the Lord allows me to use an Old Testament example into New Testament or church-age truths, this has to be communicated. Because for most of us that are religiously brainwashed, I'm saying we're in a religious side of Jesus, not the king side of Jesus, not the real Jesus. In essence, you know, well, that's the old covenant. It's done away with. I'm in a new covenant. Well, the new covenant fulfilled an old covenant that we still operate principles that are in an old covenant. Well, I'm not under the law. Are you under the thought process, thou shalt not commit murder? Just because Jesus saved you and the grace of God is upon your life doesn't mean you're not under, thou shalt not kill. I mean, because if that was the case, we could probably get to heaven quicker. Because we could personally eliminate righteousness or unrighteousness ourselves. Oh, you don't? Okay. In the old covenant, God actually allowed his righteous nation conquer and utterly destroy unrighteous people. That means... They weren't even in the planet now to create a problem. So if we're really not under that law, why don't we take it upon ourselves who know the Bible and go ahead and just eliminate everybody that's not living right. That way the only people on the planet are the righteous ones and Jesus would have to come back because there's nobody else to save. Sure, this is stupid. Obviously, we don't do this, which tells us you're still under, even in grace, thou shalt not kill. That's what I'm saying. So there's these Old Testament examples in our history that lets us know that in this new and better covenant we're in, but that it actually makes life stricter for us to live. Because Jesus literally said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. That literally means, by example, is that he says, I've come to tighten it up. That means go to another belt loop. Tighten it up. Honestly, it was easier to live under the old covenant. Okay, you don't want to hear that. Because there was a layer of responsibility God could not associate with you because all of you, all those in the old covenant were dead without Christ. But in the new covenant, you are actually born again now. You actually house the Holy Spirit. He's not in the holies of holies now. You don't need a priest to go through to talk to heaven. You can hear from heaven all by yourself. So you don't even have the excuse. I didn't have a priest around to help me. The Lord's like, I was in you. I was talking to your spirit. I was having the conversation. I was the one personally saying, don't think like that. Don't act like that. Don't behave that way. I was the one that says, if you'll just yield to me, boom, the power show up and you'll do some awesome things right now. But you wouldn't relent. Hallelujah. Is it better? You bet it's better because I'm not dependent if Seth was the high priest. I'm not dependent on Seth to be right with God so I can be right with God. So it's better. Whether you make it or not doesn't stop me. So it says this, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, these are all warnings, markers, danger in our history book written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. And then people say this all the time, you know, if you don't learn from your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Can I give you a little insight on that? Sinful people will always repeat their history, 
even when they know it. They always will because there's nothing new under the sun and sin always produces death. Someone will rise up and say, you know what? I could be a dictator better than the rest. And he'll fail just like anyone else. Uh, my company fell just like anyone else. There are so many people aspire and you're like, haven't we seen this already fall apart? Why are we going down this road? Because sin gets you in pride and you get blinded and it's always the same. The only way you break the cycle is to get born again, to get life in you. And then you're like, you're not trying to do it anymore. You're saying, what do you want me to do, Lord? Right? But we ourselves, if we don't renew our mind, we'll fail. Even covenant. Even in covenant. He says our position in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end. We are just as capable of messing it up as they were. So don't be naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easy as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. Cultivate God confidence. And let's just be honest. How many of you are born again right now? Okay, how many of you have actually done something contrary to Scripture and you've gotten sin? Okay, how many of you realize, i got to repent now because I know I'm wrong? Aren't you glad that we can repent and God forgive us? Yes. Now, that didn't mean we lost our salvation, had to get reborn again. That just means we know we're out of right standing with God. We shouldn't have done that, which tells us you're exempt to fall. You're not exempt to fall if you do not continue to apply God's Word crucify your flesh daily. If you don't crucify the flesh daily, it shows up every day. Isn't it amazing how, no matter how spiritually mature you think you are, or spiritually knowledgeable, let's say biblically knowledgeable, you are. That flesh can show up. You take a week off from reading the word and prayer, things will start aggravating you again. It's like, I thought I dealt with you already. <laughs> it show back up, you do it. Hey, you gonna let me in? Because you're not doing what's necessary to keep it down. And it's easier to live that life when you just want to go to heaven when you die. Well, I can't help it. You know, we're all just sorry sinners saved by grace. No, I'm not. I was a sorry sinner. I've been saved by grace through faith. Now, I am a believer. I have capacity. I have a king's anointing. I can kill. I can put down the flesh. I am not under the law of sin and death anymore. Sin does not own me anymore. I, I, it doesn't rule me. I can say, no, I'm not going to submit to you. No, I will not do what you're saying. No. Okay, you know, I'm feeling it right now, so I'm going to get in the word right now. Because I'm feeling it right now, but I'm going to get in the word right now. I'm going to read this word so I can build myself up so that I don't go there, look at that, do this, do that, things that are contrary to my nature. Amen? So with that being said, turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 17, chapter 17, we're going to look at the example of David. This is the king's anointing. This is the king's cause. The king has a cause. Is there not a cause, guys? If there's ever been a cause, it's, it's the king's cause. And the king says, I've come, I was born, and this is the reason why I showed up. It's because I'm a king. And because I'm a king, then I'm going to destroy the works of the devil. I'm coming as a king with the authority of heaven to destroy the works of the devil. While I'm on the planet... Because he didn't come as a king to destroy the works of the devil in heaven. Because that got taken care of a long time ago. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That was pretty quick. Done. Father spoke, he was out. Adam could have spoke in the garden and he'd have been out. But Adam ate. He ate instead of spoke. That's our problem. Some of us are eating instead of speaking. You're eating too much YouTube, you're eating too much social media, eating too much Fox and CNN, you're eating too much other voices instead of speaking the word. All right? So we get here in the 17th chapter, and just I'm going to go through a few. We're going to land in verse 26, okay? For the sake of time, I'm going to say a few things. I'm, here's our passage, 21 to 29, but I'm going to land in 26. And so David... If you read the whole chapter, his father's like, okay, your, boy, your, your older brothers, the three older brothers, David is the youngest of them all. Your three older brothers are at war. Here's some food. Go take it to them, but then also go take it to their captain, okay? I want you to bring a provision for them. And so David obviously left some people with the sheep, and he went with another person that helped him and showed up and began to, you know, get the food to his brothers and the captain. While he was there, this guy shows up on the scene out in the valley, He's a real tall guy. We know him by the name of Goliath. He was a giant. 
He's a very tall man. Some scholars say he's at least 9'6", at least 9'6". Some have him taller, but nothing smaller than 9 feet 6 inches. Cole, would you come here for a second, please? Yeah, you're like, man, he's calling me. Yes, I am. I'm calling you. Come here real quick. Okay, just real fast, because I need you to get perspective, okay? Cole is 6'7". Are you 6'7"? Is that what you are? Yeah, 6'7". Come here, Cole. Cole, by all rights, is a pretty tall guy, okay? I mean, there are some people that are 7 feet, but that's only about 4 inches taller than him, you know? And so Cole is 6'7". <laughs> right? So, you understand now, okay, that here is a problem. I mean, every time I hug Cole, I'm kissing his belly button, so to speak. I mean, it's like, please forgive me, right? I mean, I try to look up when I give him a, hey, Cole, what's up? Right? Because, I mean, it's just so awkward right here, right here. So he's only 6'7", so we're talking three, two feet taller. Two feet taller. All right? What do you think? No, it's about two feet. Come on, stand right here. Stand right there, Cole. Get up on there. All right, so here's Goliath now. See, I'm not, I'll never hug this man again in my life. It never happened. It never happened. Okay? This guy is about 9'6 now, okay? And he's out there taunting the armies of God. Right? Now, David... It's still just a youth, but most youth are still taller than me, so that's why we're using me, all right? So you understand, standing beside Goliath, this is what basically David was up against. Thank you, Cole. You can please be seated. And even if he's, even if he's seated, he's still probably taller than I am. <laughs> Thanks, Cole. So David, now obviously, you think about it, from a mountain perspective, Goliath really couldn't have looked that big maybe. So he was down the valley. But obviously he looked so much bigger than everybody else. They knew. They had, he, I'm sure he brought a scale with him. His little armor bearer came out, you know, and he did like Cole did, tapped him way down here. Okay? Perspective. But he's taunting. <clears throat> David hears. I said, David hears. <clears throat> and when David hears this, <clears throat> David has a different mouth and perspective. What gives David this perspective? You have to know David has already been anointed as king. He's already been anointed as king. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So he has a king's anointing on him. Was it to just serve? Because we act like being born of God is just to serve. Oh, okay, yeah. The reason I'm born of God, we're to serve, Jesus serves, so that's what I serve. You know what? We don't just serve, we conquer. Yeah. We rule. Yeah. We reign. Yeah. We push back the powers of darkness. Yeah. We don't just go give service to people, you know, and, and go hand out food and distribute. You think the church has been relegated to just giving to the poor now? You know, we got to make sure that we give food and give clothes, and that's what the church's assignment really is, is to help those who don't have anything. The wealthiest people don't have Jesus. They don't have Jack. Amen. They don't have Jack, and if we don't push back the principalities that are influencing them, we may never even get to them. And we're just satisfied with handing out clothes and giving food. David wasn't satisfied with just handing out clothes and giving food. He's like, what? And they're like, he's hearing what the guy says. He's like, man, if somebody go down there and kick that guy's tail, man, you know what happened? He will give him, the king will give that man his daughter, Right? And he will then, you know, do something else for this guy, and then he'll have his whole family don't even pay taxes the rest of their time. And they're like, David's like, what? He's thinking, that's a deal. Why is it nobody running? <laughs> right? Because even without it, I don't, why is nobody running? Why is nobody going down there? Verse 26, it says this, Then David spoke to the men who stood beside him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine, takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, David is talking to covenant people. They're all in covenant. Not one person is not in covenant. But nobody in covenant is moving. There are churches filled with covenant people. And
and nobody's moving. We just want to sing Kumbaya and worship on Sunday. We don't want to get up early and come pray. We don't want to get up early and, and, and read the word and transform our thinking and submit down to the things of God so that we, he can rise, raise us up to fight giants in our land now. No, we just want to be content to go to heaven when we die. And when we get there, just give me a shack anyway. I, I don't deserve nothing. It's our mentality. But David's like, guys, we're in covenant. Who is this uncircumcised, that's covenant talk, this uncircumcised Philistine? He's not even in covenant with God. This is an uncovenant person yeah. rule, trying to rule us, trying to make us slaves again. Oh, okay. He goes on and says, the people answered and said to him the same manner, so that the man who kills him and now his oldest brother, you know, his oldest brother had some problems with him, and he was angry. Uh, David, and he says, why did you come down here? He says, with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? In essence, trying to say, you're not a warrior. You're just a shepherd boy. I know your pride. Notice, he sure was telling him about his heart. Wasn't he? I know your pride and the insolent of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? See, too many people take up their own calls and not the calls of the Lord. The world keeps selling us their calls with right and wrong and good and evil, but ours again is life and death. And so David has this confrontation in it from his brother of his own house that the only reason he's like this is because his oldest brother looks like the sitting king, King Saul. And instead of God looking at him and saying, you're the guy, he looked for a guy with a heart. Oh, you don't want to hear this. Let's go on over here to Samuel. Let me jump on over there real quick and I'll come back. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or, the physical, or, or, or at his physical statue because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? Heart. He looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. So again, no wonder the older brother has this attitude because he's like, the prophet came and didn't pick me. In fact, didn't pick none of us. We had to wait for our youngest brother to show up and he wouldn't even let us sit down. Yet here he is, listen, in covenant of Israel, he's going to get a double portion once dad dies. He's the guy that's supposed to still keep the lineage of the family going. But the Lord's like, you ain't the man. David is. David's the man. In fact, David's king. And he watched the prophet anoint him with oil. Oh. And here he knows, my brother someday will rule me. And we need him to. You know why? Because the one who gets a double portion is too afraid to go fight a giant. Right. Come on. Too afraid. Why? Because his heart wasn't completely his. And the reason why some people, I'm not saying in here alone, but there are some here. The reason why God has not done more in your life is because he actually doesn't have completely you. There is a big difference between Jesus in your lost status, your rebellion to the crown. Jesus, I realize that I can't be right without you and your blood. I confess my sin. I ask you to save me. I call you Lord of my life. And in that infancy, in the trueness of that belief, you're made born again. You're a new creature in Christ and you're alive to God. And then the Holy Ghost comes up on the inside with your spirit and says, okay, child of God, let me teach you how to be a king. The problem is if you don't renew your mind, you will keep a slave mentality with a king's authority. <clears throat> because you're not really giving him what Jesus said, I want. Because we stop at the confession of faith, which is a spiritual realm. We call it the heart. But notice he says who's completely, completely his. 
Completely is everything Jesus let you know what's complete. You are going to love me with all your... Did he stop? With all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. So, all your heart, you're going you're gonna to let me have your spirit. You're going to let me have your soul, which is your emotions. You're going to quit being led by your emotions. No more do you let the way you feel dictate what you do. I want that. Because you're going to feel like not coming to church. You're going to feel like not reading. You're going to feel like not praying. You're going to feel like not fighting the good fight. You give me that, give me that, and I'll change that feeling. If you'll give me that, I'll get it connected to this conquering spirit that you are, and I'll change that feeling. Then I want your mind. I want you to think like I think. I need to renew that thing. I need you to get in the word so that I can teach you, educate you, get you to change your thinking. You got a slave mentality, and I need you to have a king's mentality. You got to quit thinking you can't defeat victim. I'll never make it. We've never made it. No one's ever made it in my family. We'll never make it. I'm no good. I'm just a piece of trash. I've been told that my whole life. You need to give me your mind and let me change your thinking. I need you to think like I think. I need you to see yourself like I see you. you. If you don't do that, you're not completely his. All you want is the heaven portion. Then he says, I want your strength. Quit working so hard Monday through Friday that it's your excuse to not show up on Sunday. Well, I work so hard, Pastor. You got to understand, I'm just tired. I thought the Lord got your strength. Let me just say this for all you who are self-employed, because you self-employed people, there's no excuse for you never to be in church. None. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't miss. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to bring condemnation to you. I'm just saying you actually can control some things, which means when you know Wednesday's coming, why do you not build your business where you're saying, now listen, we're going to take this job, but know this. On Wednesdays, we'll always shut down here. The only reason you're there is because you broke some pipe and now their whole house is flooding and you got to do something. Okay, I get that. I recognize. Can't. Do you need to pray? I'll go to church and pray the water stops too. I understand that. But you know how often that actually happens? And if it's happening every Wednesday, you might want to check what's wrong with you that's opening that door. All I'm saying is you should go in and say, I make a decision that I know that today may be a rough day, but today will not get all my strength. I will be in the house of the Lord today. I'll be in the house of the Lord today. I'll be there. I'm going to show up. I'm going to do this. Amen. And if you're employed and you work during that time, you should say, you know what? There are 7.9 billion people on the planet. And there are a lot of people right now in the United States that aren't even working. Lord, you can get me into a place either with this company that gets me off or you move me to one through a promotion that allows me to be able to have that off as well. Because I'm not going to let the world have my strength. And you want to know why you're not defeating giants? Because Jesus said, I want you to love me with all your Oh, is there not a cause? You know what? Last night, there were people throughout our whole nation up into all hours of the night. They were giving their strength to a cause. Pastor, 6 a.m. morning prayer on Tuesday, that's just too early. They're giving their strength to a cause. We want God to move without praying. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. God needs us to pray. In fact, Jesus says, when you pray. And how often did he pray? Let me just ask this question. How many of you last night, and I was not, okay, just, just to preface, But last night, you're like, there's a lot of unrest in our nation about this decision that just went down. And people are out with a cause. And there's principalities and powers out there trying to make power. I'm going to stay up and pray. The 
definitely lets us know there's still more that we can actually do. Now, I'm not saying everybody, some people are like, man, the Lord's, you know, my ministry is prayer. You know, I'm an intercessor. A lot of those people aren't interceding for nothing, but for attention. They're interceding for attention. But if you were truly into something about prayer, you probably would have been up last night. Because those people are not operating in their flesh alone. They are being directed by principalities and powers. And they're giving their soul, their mind, and their strength to the cause. And they're fearless about it. They'll break windows. They'll burn buildings. They'll graffiti, deface property, all which are punishable under U.S. law. But we'll do it without fear. Do it without fear. Is there not a cause? Hallelujah. Is there not a cause? I tell you, man, with the youth, I wanted to preach that little message, man, that was like, you know, cutesy. They love you. But I'm always constrained. I told one minister before I ministered, I said, yeah, we're going to hear a pin drop. I just didn't think it would come to this house. Now, at the end of the day, if you sit there and say, man, pastor making me feel bad. I'm not making you feel bad. I'm calling you to a cause. And at the end of the day, if you're like, hmm, I didn't think about that, then let's think about it. That's what I'm saying. Let's think about it. And then say, Lord, shall I stay up tonight? Because you know how many Christians there are? Because you understand, in Korea, Dr. Cho would have to pray four hours before he even went into office. He says, in the U.S., y'all pray out of convenience. We pray for survival. And I get it. Certain situations will put pressure. But here's the thing. Why do we always wait till it's horrible? Why do we actually do what the history book shows us that they did under the old covenant? That all hell breaks loose in their land before they repent and turn back to God. Why in the new covenant do we do the same thing? In fact, James 4, 4, the passion says it this way. You have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair, an unholy relationship with the world. Don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. This is why... Any cause that's ever happening on Facebook, Instagram, CNN, Fox News, the U.S. government, somewhere else in the world, I am not obligated to stand and hold their banner and post about it. And let me just give you a little clue. As believers, if the whole world is responding about a situation the exact same way, you might want to question whether that was led by the Spirit of God. If governments are standing up and saying, this is how we're going to handle it, and you know in those governments are abuses, in those governments are are, uh, human trafficking, in those governments are um, all kinds of sins, um, why are we listening? Just because something is wrong happening doesn't mean that's the way we address it. I remember back when George Floyd died, was killed. I had someone in the church come up to me, you know, and said, wanted to meet with me because I wasn't particularly addressing it. I was just preaching the Bible. And, you know, as a, as a pastor, you know, I am connected with current events. But at the end of the day, I cannot just talk about something on my own. Why is that? Well, you should, because your silence is saying something. Well, then let's go to Jesus. Because they grabbed a woman caught in adultery, drug her naked body to Jesus, 
threw it in front of him and said, we call her in the very act, the law says that you stone such. And Jesus knows that's the law. Did he pick up their cause? No, he got down and did this and became silent. And he began to write in the sand. Why? Because Jesus had already told us, I don't say anything on my own initiative, but only what the Father says. And I can't get emotional about something I'm seeing without hearing from heaven. Now, again, I understand what the kickback is on that. Well, that's easy for you to say because of the way you look. Well, thank you for judging me by my outward appearance. And that's not how God does it. You might need to go back and read 1 Samuel again. Because I don't see people on the outside. In fact, the Bible tells me to regard no man according to the flesh. Does it hurt? Yes. What's going on, Lord? Mm. Help me. And so I communicate to the church after that meeting. If I don't say something, just know this. Your pastor's writing in the sand. I got to find out from heaven. And here's the thing. I'm not the only spokesman for heaven. There were some other ministers in our land during that time that were speaking extremely correct on the matter. A lot were not. A lot sounded like the world. Just like the world. Protested like the world. Literally. I'm like, my gosh. Where's the spirit of discernment with any of them? Because let me tell you, when you get up call Jesus' cause, you're going to get singled out. David said, is there not a cause? He's the only guy that says, I can do this because God's with me. I'm in covenant. What are the giants of the world today? Obviously governments. I mean, you know how many churches are not doing anything because they won't go up against the governments of their community? Governments of their community are pushing them around, telling them what to do, and they won't stand. I remember when we had our first conflict with our natural government. We were over at this... Uh, 312 location across from Cobblestone. It's where Babcock is. It was the, the building's over. We were going to start a church there, or be it, have the church move there from Gamble Rogers. We're there, excited. We've got it plastered on the front. We're starting our first service that Sunday. It's Thursday before the Sunday. We're doing all the finishing touches on our remodel, and a guy shows up from the county with a badge and says, stop your work. You can't even be here. You're not zoned for this location. I've signed a three-year lease. It's there, it's done, and he says, you can't do it. I came out and says, okay. So, he said, don't kill the messer. I said, I have no problem. You're doing your job. Just tell me what the conflict is. Well, you're not zoned for this. I said, man, that's funny. I mean, I called the county. I talked to zoning itself. I said, I'm a little confused. If you would just tell me who I need to talk to, I'd be more than happy to go down and try to clear this up. He goes, wow, you're really taking this well. I said, man, you're just doing your job. I don't have a fight with him. I don't have a fight with you. My fight is a principality and power. There's something out there that wants to stop the church. And that's what I'll go after. Because this is not, my battle's not with, with flesh and blood. So I went down to the county, the zoning manager at the time, they're not there today, but the zoning manager at the time sat down and showed me that we were actually in what's called a PUD, plan unit development. And there was a list of allowable uses in that list. And in that list, church did not show up. So based upon that interpretation, I was not supposed to be there. I'm like, wow, okay. I said, well, you know, I called. Well, you know, obviously the one who answered the phone, they were confused because you can be in a commercial general or commercial intensive zoning, but they didn't look at the PUD and you can't be there. So you're really not going to be able to stay. Well, that's a problem <laughs> because I actually heard God say to be here. He told me this was my next move. So apparently, the human's going to have to change. And I'm just going to have to stand. I went to my attorney that day, sent it over to him. They read it. They said, now, Pastor, all this top paragraph right here says that you meet the spirit and intent. Obviously, they couldn't list everyone's name. And because you do that, you should be allowed. I went Monday and said what my attorney said to the zoning manager. And that person said, we've never interpreted it that way. I said, that's okay. I'm in the business of changing people's thinking. <laughs> so
so let's just do it that way. But they wouldn't do it. Why? Because the, the giant of government, oh my gosh, have you noticed that nobody wants to actually take the say? They push you from one department to another department. Why? They want you to get lost in their giant government that they just push you around so much that you just get exhausted for trying and then you just quit or you concede and go somewhere else. But I knew the Lord said we were supposed to be there. So I called my attorney and said, well, this is what they're saying. He says, Pastor Earl, I can't tell you they won't throw you in jail, but I can tell you you can legally stay there based upon this federal law. Because he looked at it again and says, because they have this 501c3, a nonprofit allowable use, they cannot discriminate from you from doing it. There's a federal law that does that because a lot of governments were establishing PUDs to push the church out of town. And that's why this federal law came in to protect your religious rights. I said, thank you. That's all I needed to know. So now I have my natural right with my spiritual right. Paul operated this way. He knew his natural right. I am a Roman. <laughs> They're like, oh my gosh, man, you're, we should have never put you. What happened? He knew his legal rights, but he also knew his spiritual rights. And so I went back from there and I began to say, listen, according to this federal law, well, when I started talking that, the giant started to, <laughs> yeah. But then they stood back up and says, you're going to have to go through all these procedures. I said, whatever. I went through them time and time, every one of them. And every giant I stood at, the county board, the planning and zoning board, back to the county board, I just spoke on behalf of the king. And ultimately that giant fell and we stayed in that location, never to leave. And had services there the whole time. I said had services there the whole time. Now it got pushed around. We got stuck in some smaller sections of it. But in the end, we never relented. We stayed the whole way. I remember coming back when we moved in here. They're like, Pastor Earl, I remember when you came here the first time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought nothing of it. Boy, you sure caused a wave. I wasn't trying to cause a wave, but I will not be pushed around. Amen. Because I'm in covenant. Amen. News outlets are giants today. They're pushing doctrine, thinking what they say is truth or misinformation. And we're talking misinformation. Well, where, where are the news of truth? There's only one source of truth. It's the Word of God and the Holy Ghost, and he knows. You know what else is? Companies. Companies are bullying us. I mean, Starbucks came out and literally said to the Christian community, if you cannot except homosexual marriages, we don't even want you to buy our products. That's what they said. How many of you had a Starbucks this week? Yeah. I mean, a lot of times we just like, we'll do it anyway. Yet they've just yelled at you and said, we can live without you and your money. You're like, good, live without it then. Fine. They're bullying us. Universities are bullying us. You know how many teenagers that don't have a good Christian foundation anyway? They've gone to church their whole life, but only because their parents told them to do that. And then they show up at church. They show up there. Y'all all right? Y'all want me to just stop right now? I can stop. I mean, they just start questioning them about their God and question them about their beliefs and then show them all these other types of lifestyles and get them out. And next thing you know, they come out atheists. They denounce God. They come back to their churches and begin to question in arrogance. You're like, I mean, I. I, I don't, I've had very little come back to Anchor Bay Church and try that. Although it has happened, but it hasn't been very successful. Why? Because you're really not fighting me anyway. You're fighting God. You're trying to say God's a liar. You're trying to say what he says isn't really, you are, you've arrived above God. Yeah. Same thing, but these are giants. And you know what? They're entrenched in our communities. We run to their football games. We invest in their booster clubs. Yet all the while, we know they're trying to destroy the next generation. I mean, it wasn't until recently that some actually started to stand up in local school boards and say, I don't think you need to teach that to our kids. And they're like, you're a domestic terrorist. I 
didn't give it that word. CNN didn't give it that word. The school board gave it that word. What have we become as a nation? And again, if all we're doing is waiting to go home to Jesus, then you don't understand your cause. Christ died for you so that he could put his kingship on you so that you could destroy the works of the devil. I mean, things going on in our community are only going on in our community because we're not even pushing back. We're not even doing it. Why in the world did that um, gambling joint show up in our community? Why are we allowing Adam and Eve to continue to function in our society? I remember when Cafe Erotica was down there uh, off of um, 207 at the 95, not because I went there, but because I went by it every day coming from work when I planted this church. And every time I stopped coming off the off ramp and looked at that thing to turn on to 206 to go to my house, I said, I curse you in the name of Jesus. I bind that spirit of lust. I command you to die. And the building's not even there today. (laughs) Building's not even there today. I mean, every time you go by to your little target, you should curse Adam and Eve. Every time you go out to the outlet malls, you should curse Hollywood Hustler and Adam and Eve. And you're like, well, now that's people's livelihood. It should not be their livelihood. The exploitation of people's bodies. And don't you think child pornography is not in that stuff? You are deranged. I mean, why do we have all these cannabis I mean, they're popping up all over the place. Now, at least our community did try to centralize a little bit. But you just say, it's de- I mean, we us pray for a healing revival so all these people with so-called back pain could get their backs healed and then they wouldn't have to have a bunch of CBD. Okay, y'all want to hear us fine. It's because we don't want to fight drugs. We don't want to fight. We don't want to fight. We want to be covenant people, stand on a dang mountain, watch the giants of the world tell us that we're too weak to do anything, and we're like, well, I know, man, sin's, oh, it's going to get bad, man, sin's bad around here. Whoo, can't wait till Jesus comes. Lord, I can't wait till Jesus comes. I, and all the while they're saying, just bring me one person, just one. And I know if somebody goes down there, they're going to die, and we're all going to be slaves. They're just running us over. They're pushing us around. But David says, is there not a cause? I'll go down there and cut it off. I'm tired of hearing it. I'm going to kill the thing. How did he kill it? He killed it with a stone. He used the word of God, so to speak, because the rock is Jesus. He killed it with the word, and then he took the weapon formed against him, which was the Goliath sword, and used it to cut his own head off. And don't you know no weapon formed against the church is going to prosper? So at the end of the day, most believers, those in covenant, are so afraid of giants of the world that they're paralyzed to fight the good fight of faith. When you take a stand against giants, you're going to look out of place. You know, Anchor Faith Church, during our COVID time, when everybody else was shutting down, we're like, man, but the Lord says, do not first, how can they shut down? How can... Home Depot be open and the church has to, how can this even be? How can they say, Pastor Earl, we need your preschool to remain open for the nurses that are going into Flagler and bringing their kids here every day? Oh, y'all don't want to hear this. (laughs) Bringing their kids every day, which means mama comes out of the COVID hospital into this facility, picks up their child Monday through Friday, but God forbid I can clean this place for a group on Sunday. Nope. So we didn't shut down. And what happened? The same thing that's happening about Roe versus Wade right now. People drove by the parking lot. They were cussing us. They were saying that we're killing our county. But that's what all giants are going to do when you come down. And you stand up and say, no, I'm going to do what God said. If there's ever a time for people to get connected to God, it's during this time. Because the spirit of fear is running rampant. And Jesus Christ's name, Christ is above COVID. He is the healer. He's the healer today. He heals today. Period. There is no disease that will ever show up that Jesus will say, well, that's too hard. Everybody's going to die. Y'all are going to die. Y'all are now going to die. There is not one, not one, never will be. 
His stripes on his back where the flesh was ripped out of him was not in vain. And if you believe, my gosh, man, I don't care if you get a symptom. You'll get it off because you're a covenant child. You'll just have to fight the good fight of faith. I mean, David had to actually run towards the giant. He had to see the guy. He had the whole opportunity to be afraid. What am I doing down here? I mean, everybody thinks I'm crazy. I mean, even the king said, you're just a little boy. This guy's been training him for his whole life, man. And then even the Goliath confirmed that. Am I a dog? You're going to send me a stick. <laughs> Seriously. Is this happening right now? And David says, hmm. He listens. To, he even listens. He wants to hear what the devil says. Wait, what are you saying? I'm going to cut your head off. Oh, so that's how this is going to work. Because the weapon formed against me can't prosper. It's going to come back on you. No, I'm going to cut your head off. And then I'm going to kill everybody behind you. And he did. I said, and he did. And in today's society, we've got to rise up. Because here's what we know about David. He was well trained. Why? Because he was a worshiper before he was ever a warrior. And some of you have forgotten your worship. You can never be a warrior without worship. Amen. Worship is what caused him to become a warrior. And just because you fought a good few fights and won, you'll lose the next one if you don't maintain your worship. Some of you are getting too prideful in your victories, walking around with your spiritual medals. Yeah, we did this, we did that, we did this, and you're not worshiping anymore. Oh, yeah, I did that. These people are worse. I mean, I know where they're at. I mean, I know what I've done. You've done nothing without him. And you'll never do anything without him. What we got to do is keep submitting. That's why when the band strikes, boom, that means before the actual clock comes down, you would already be in here like, man, I wish they would hurry up. I'm ready to sing and worship God. <laughs> uh, David was a talker of, to the Lord. Most of his songs are because he was actually carrying on a conversation with God. 930 had prayer corporately. Let's have a conversation. Why does not prayer look like this? And then we just flow into. Oh, you don't It's fine. But here's what I know. The anointing of the one, the anointing on the one with a heart after God is a giant killer. Because this is what I know. When God has your heart, he will crown you king. When he has your heart, he will crown you king. See, those afraid of giants will try to make you feel ashamed for standing up against them. But your confidence in God will strengthen the ones around you who are fearful. When you take up the cause of God, even the enemy's own weapons will become yours. And let me just say this. God is still looking for a man after his own heart today. In closing, John chapter 17, verses 14 and 15, the Passion says this, I have given them your message, and that is why the unbelieving world hates them, for their allegiance is no longer to this world because I'm not of this world. I'm not asking that you remove them from the world, but I ask that you guard their hearts from evil, for they no longer belong to this world any more than I do. Your word is truth, so make them holy by your truth. 1 John 4, 4 says it this way, the contemporary English version, children, you belong to God, and you have defeated these enemies. God's spirit in you is more powerful than the one that is in the world. In these last of the last days, when sin and lawlessness will abound, that just lets me know that there will be many giant slayers throughout the world pushing back darkness and taking territory. Just the bigger it seems impossible. The, I mean, the more impossible it looks, the bigger that mountain seems, that giant in that land, community, whatever, if you have I've got to have your whole heart, he'll anoint you king to stand up against it. And you'll defeat it every time. King, you're going to a giant. 
The Giants, a university, not only that, but also a government. And there'll be a lot of pushing. And then you've got this. You have to submit as a soldier, which means there's some things you'll just have to do. Even though the individuals saying it are totally gone and out. Now, I'm not saying you're going to do unrighteous things because they're going to order you to do it. But I'm just saying you're going to be taking orders from people. You're like, man, they shouldn't even have that rank. But as you submit with all your heart, even without the rank, you'll rise. You'll rise. And could it be that they'll look back in history and say there was a guy named King who was a king that showed up at the Naval Academy and changed its culture forever? For some, that would be improbable. For others, it'd be impossible. But with God, who's looking for a man to show himself strong in, it's obtainable. It's obtainable. Anybody else going to a school after they graduate? It's obtainable. Anybody in business, it's obtainable for you to become a global giant if necessary. Whatever God needs you to be, if you'll just stay with the Lord, give him your whole heart, rise up as a David generation, where all of a sudden you conquer giants because David taught his men how to conquer giants. And it's my job as a pastor to teach you how to conquer giants. Not only are we doing it in the church realm, we're doing it in the business realm. We're going to do it in the university realm. We're going to do it in the education realm. We're going to do it in every realm. We're going to stand toe to toe with the word of our king. We will not relent because in these last days, God is looking for his kings of the earth to rise, to rise, to rise. Let's pray.